Hi everyone, this is Julian from AWS. This episode is called Machine Learning from A to Z. Not because I'm going to explain all of it in, uh, in 15 minutes, but because I'm going to go from A to Z and explain some machine learning terminology that is frequently used and it's often confusing and intimidating, especially if you're just starting with machine learning. So hopefully this short episode will give you a better understanding of those uh, important words. And as usual, I will try to explain all of it with minimal jargon and, uh, and minimal uh, theory. Okay. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to my channel or my podcast to get all the future episodes. Let's get started. So here we go. Accuracy. Okay, accuracy. Accuracy is important. Accuracy is the, one of the key metrics you're going to use in order to evaluate how well your model does. So the, the simple definition of accuracy is run a number of predictions, count how many correct predictions you're making, divide uh, that number by the total number of predictions you made, and you have accuracy. Okay. Simple as that, um, easy to understand, especially for non-technical users. So um, that's probably the number one metric people will want to hear about. Backpropagation. Ah, there we go. Backpropagation is really central to, um, to deep learning. It's, uh, it's an algorithm that lets you update the weights in the neural network. So forward propagation means um, placing input data on the input layer of the neural network and letting the neural network compute um, activation values layer by layer, etc. And then when you get to the end, you have some kind of prediction. And of course, in the early stages of the training process, it's going to be it's going to be wrong. So back propagation is actually going to go back uh, from the output layer to the input layer and update weights as it goes. And there's a bit of magic here because of course it has to update the weights um, in the right direction, right? Weights are numerical values and they need to be updated just right so that every update actually reduces prediction error, okay? And backpropagation is the algorithm that does that. Convolution. Convolution is a mathematical function. It's a, it's a way to combine two math functions. Um, in the context of neural networks, convolution has really been the, uh, you could say the breakthrough technology that made um, computer vision um, efficient with neural networks, um, with Yann uh, Lequin and, uh, and other researchers. So in the context of deep learning, convolution is basically how you extract patterns from images. And you do this using convolution filters. They're also called kernels. And they're a small, uh, a small two or three dimensional array of numbers that you slide across the image or the, the batch of images that you want to uh, extract patterns from. And, uh, and that's what convolution is. And once again, this is what made all those crazy um, computer vision applications possible. Data set. Well, that's an obvious one. Um, you can't really do machine learning without data. And, uh, and building a data set is really the, the, the main task. Uh, you know, once you have your data ready, uh, cleaned, etc., uh, you could say, you know, the hardest part of the job is done. Uh, because if you have a, a poorly maintained data set, you're never going to get any good results. As I say all the time, you know, garbage in, garbage out. If you have the best algorithm possible, it's not going to be efficient. So um, caring for your data, um, uh, you know, cleaning it, filling in missing values, uh, adding new data, etc., is really, really central. And uh, that's what data scientists spend a lot of time doing, curating the data sets. Um, because again, that's the starting point for the whole machine learning story. Epic. So an epoch is just a complicated word for um, an iteration, really. So uh, again, in the context of, uh, of deep learning specifically, an epoch means pushing the data set through the neural network once. 
okay so you go through the data set um, batch by batch and uh, or sample by sample if you want to do that uh, and you uh, once you've reached the end of the data set that's called an epoch and typically you train for maybe hundreds of epochs if you have really large uh, problems to work on like again computer vision models are typically very very uh, slow to train so that's what an epoch is going through the data set once feature feature um, after after data sets I think features are maybe the next uh, most important thing so features are high level variables that um, that the model will use to uh, that the algorithm will use sorry to train the model and you could say well, if I have a um, you know a well-defined data set, let's say I have a, a, a data set with data in columns, these are my features, right? Well, maybe, maybe not. Uh, maybe some uh, columns, let's call them like that, in your data set are good enough, expressive enough for the the algorithm to learn, uh, or maybe you could just uh, transform them or or build new features from them that help the model learn. Okay, and the example I take all the time is imagine you have a street address in your data set. Um, it's going to be a bunch of strings, right? And uh, that's not really helpful for, for a machine learning algo. They want numbers. So uh, if you transform the street address into GPS coordinates, then you know, that starts making much more sense because it's a numerical representation and, and uh, the algo can work much better with that than it would work with uh, text strings, even if you encoded them in some way. So feature engineering is the, the, the set of techniques that you apply in order to build features from the raw data set. And again, that's one of the key skills for data scientists. Lots of cooking recipes and, and black magic sometimes. Gradient. Ha, ah, gradient. Um, so again, gradient is, is a complicated word uh, to say something simple. And uh, a gradient is basically a tiny update that you apply to um, to uh, a machine learning parameter and the word is mostly used for again for deep learning where during back propagation um, running um, an optimization algo we decide how to update weights uh, you know increase them a bit decrease them a bit and we do that for each individual weight and the update that we apply is called the gradient and this comes from math, as you would expect. You're probably familiar with derivatives. So when you compute the derivative for, uh, for a simple function, uh, well, you know, it's called a derivative. And when you compute the derivative for all dimensions of a function that has multiple, uh, multiple uh, variables, then you build a vector with all the individual derivatives, and it's called a gradient. So that's where the word comes from. But again, it's a, it's a complicated thing for, uh, for a simple thing, right? Just tiny updates that are iteratively applied to machine learning parameters. Hyperparameter. So hyperparameters are training parameters, okay? When we say parameter in machine learning, we really mean model parameter, okay? So parameters that are learned and updated during the training process, okay? Automatically, you could say. Now, hyperparameters are parameters that you, the user, the machine learning engineer, set for the training process. So, for example, how many epochs do you want to, uh, to run, to train for? Uh, what's the size, uh, what's the batch size you want to use for the training process, and so on, okay? Um, so these are really generic parameters, but every machine learning algo is going to have specific hyperparameters. And you could say for a, a neural network, how many layers you have and how wide they are, etc. These are hyperparameters too. And finding the correct set, the optimal set of hyperparameters, the, 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 the one group of values that give you the, the best accuracy is a hard problem, especially if you do it manually, uh, which is why... A lot of practitioners use techniques called hyperparameter optimization that uh, use machine learning to find those optimal hyperparameters. Okay, so machine learning to improve machine learning, that, that's pretty cool. Hyperparameters, that's what they are. Iteration. So iterations uh, are, again, central to machine learning. Okay, the, the training process 
um, will slice the data set into batches that are fed to the algo and then uh, we run some kind of optimization process um, and once we've we're done with an epoch then we do that again so another level of iteration over epochs and even from a i would say development perspective you know machine learning is a highly iterative process you're going to try lots of different algos lots of different parameters lots of different tweaks and uh, when you get started with machine learning usually you think oh wow okay i trained this model that's really cool it works uh, and you're happy with it and you think you're done but no uh, in the in the process uh, in the course of a single project uh, machine learning engineers typically train hundreds if not thousands of different models so you have to have this right uh, mindset okay uh, try all kinds of things use your intuition and uh, and keep looking for the best possible combination you know i think your your work is never really done when you're working with machine learning just do it yeah i couldn't come up with a, a word starting with <laughs> <laughs> so um, so here's my motivational uh, speech so just do it I mean if you're listening to this you're probably new to machine learning or re or quite new so just don't don't be afraid I mean just go for it and uh, and don't let the the mumbo jumbo and don't let all the you know the um, uh, the elite mentality that you you sometime uh, have to uh, deal with in this community uh, don't let that stuff uh, bring you down i mean you, you can all do it right it's uh machine learning is is mostly code there's a little bit of theory but it's mostly code and uh, and you can do it so um and we need a lot of machine learning engineers we need m many many more so just go and do it right don't uh, don't let anything stand in your way keras ah keras so keras is uh is an open source library for uh, for uh, machine learning and deep learning and uh, i i mentioned it because it's my favorite one by far i think it's the easiest one to get started with it has really good documentation uh, a really good blog um, tons of tutorials and uh, it's um, it's really beginner friendly and yet uh, you can go really really deep with it it's uh, it lets you build extremely advanced models uh, especially now that it's uh, tightly integrated in the new TensorFlow uh, version. Uh, Keras started as a high-level API on top of TensorFlow. Now it's really, really integrated. And, uh, and you can go from super high-level to super custom. So uh, again, I would recommend that you start there. Loss. Uh, loss, again, is another co complicated word meaning error. Uh, so when you hear about prediction loss, that means prediction error. And, um, and this is really central to, uh, to a lot of machine learning algos and especially deep learning where um, we measure the difference between uh, the predictions and reality. Okay, what machine learning people call ground truth. Okay, so uh, uh, this image is a dog, this image is a cat, this image is a, an elephant. Okay, go and predict all three. And then you measure um, the distance, uh, quote unquote, between the predictions and the reality, right? And, um, and that's the role of this uh, function called the loss function to measure that distance. Okay, because a lot of those predictions are vectors, so you need to have some kind of way to measure the difference or the distance between those vectors. Okay, um, loss functions are part of the uh, package when you use um, uh, libraries like Keras, TensorFlow, and more. So you have a whole range of loss functions to to choose from. Uh, of course, you can implement your own if you if you really know what you're doing if you're working with a specific problem and you want a different way of measuring error between predictions and uh, and uh, truth then of course you can write your own okay and uh, and again this is really central to the learning process because how well you measure that error uh, tells you how you will update uh, your parameters using maybe back propagation so you have to get your loss function right for sure model well, a model is what we're, where we're trying to get. Um, so a model starts from an algorithm that you apply on a data set. And, uh, and by exploring, uh, looking at the data set, um, the algo will update its parameters. And, and when the training process is done, you have a model. Okay, So the model is really a combination of um, an algorithm, hyperparameters, for that specific training job 
and a data set to learn from. Okay, and a model is what you use to predict. Neuron. Neuron. Well, uh, um, I have a few left, hopefully. But uh, in the context of deep learning, a neuron is just a simple mathematical construct with inputs, um, which are floating point values. And each input is assigned a weight, which again is a floating point uh, value. And, uh, and the operation that a neuron computes is called multiply and accumulate, which is very simple. It takes each input, multiply it, multiplies it by its associated weight, okay? And then it sums everything, okay? So if you have uh, three inputs, then you have three multiplications, right? Weight multiplied by uh, input. And then you add up those three, uh, uh, those three products, okay? Multiply and accumulate. And that's what a neuron does, okay? And the, the basic idea, of course, is to mimic the biological neuron, which um, has inputs and, uh, and based on, you know, how, how much electrical current is flowing there, the neuron fires or not, okay? So the neuron is really that multiply and accumulate operation, and it's always associated or extremely often associated with uh, an activation function, which is another small math function that introduces a, a non-linear behavior. Because just like I said, a neuron sometimes does fire or sometimes doesn't. Okay, so there's a threshold there. And, um, and that's the purpose of the activation function to say, hey, this neuron should fire or it shouldn't. And uh, the, a popular function used today is called RELU, R-E-L-U. And it's a very simple function. If the input, so uh, if the multiply and accumulate value is negative, then ReLU outputs zero. Okay, so the neuron does not fire. And uh, if the multiply and accumulate value, also called the activation value, is positive, then ReLU outputs that same value. Okay, so that introduces that nonlinear behavior. Okay, so uh, to the left of zero, nothing happens. To the right of zero, you, you just output whatever you received. And this could be a really large value too. Okay. So that's very simple math. That's how neurons uh, work and activation functions. And uh, of course, when you put all those neurons together, you know, magic happens. Optimizer. Optimizer. So the optimizer is the, the function, the actual function that updates the, the weights uh, during back propagation. Okay, remember back propagation starts from the output layer, looks at uh, loss. Now we know what loss is, and it goes layer by layer from the back to the front and updates the weights. Okay, and the optimizer uh, is how you do that. Okay, so the optimizer decides how weights are actually updated. Okay, and there are a, a whole bunch of functions to do that, and uh, and we'll see one called SGD in a few minutes. Python. Well, I don't want to get religious, but you know, Python is really the number one language you uh, you should learn if you want to get into machine learning. So R is another popular choice, and now we have libraries for Java and, and whatnot. But Python is still the the dominant language, and libraries again like uh, TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, MXNet, and so on have uh, a Python API, and uh, plus the the Python ecosystem is super rich in libraries like NumPy, Pandas, Scikit-learn, uh, etc. Make it, uh, you know, they're really mandatory tools to, uh, to work with. So, you know, Python is the one to start from if you have to start from something. Quantile. Ah, quantile. So that's a, that's a, a little more obscure. So um, sometimes, um, I would say most of the times when you, when you build your model, you're going to predict and, and output a single prediction, okay? So you're going to output a numerical value predicting the price of houses in, in, your, uh, in your district or how many kilometers of uh, traffic jams Paris will have tomorrow. Uh, well, the answer is more than yesterday. And, um, and that's just a single number. So some, for some problems, uh, like forecasting, for example, Outputting a single value is not really helpful, okay? Because you don't want to know that it's going to be uh, 556 kilometers of traffic jam. Why 56? Why not 57? Why not 53? 
So you want to output probabilities. You would say, well, it would be more useful to say, well, there's an 80% chance that we have between 550 and 600. And, uh, and there's a 95 probability that we'll get less than uh, 680 kilometers. Okay. So you want to output ranges of values and uh, with probabilities. And these are called quantiles. Okay. So uh, P they're referred to as P90, P50, etc. And for example, P90 means 90% of predictions will be lower than this. Okay. Uh, and only 10% will be higher. So uh, if, you, or, uh, if you compare P10 to P90, okay, you will have 80% of probabilities, 80% uh, of predictions stored between those two values. Okay, so when you want to um, build probabilistic uh, predictions, quantiles are what you need to do. Regularization. Regularization is a technique that uh, helps your model uh, learn better, okay? Uh, and um, the way you do this is uh, you penalize, uh, you make it a little harder for the model to predict. You make it a little harder for the model to update weights. And, uh, and you could say, why do we want to do this? Well, we want to do this because sometimes the model learns too well, okay? Um, and especially neural networks are extremely good at learning literally anything and sometimes they learn really too well and uh, there is such a thing as, as learning too well unfortunately and the problem here is if they learn the training set too well then they won't do a good job at anything else they won't do a good job at uh, other uh, data real life data that you're gonna uh, send to the model so to make it harder okay, to, uh, for the model to learn the training set, you use regularization techniques. Okay, there are plenty. But um, if you see your model learning really, really well, doing great on the training set and doing poorly on, on real life data, then maybe you need to apply regularization to make it just a little harder. Just make the model work harder at, uh, at learning that data set, hoping that you know, it will also do better on uh, on real life data. SGD. So SGD means uh, stochastic gradient descent, and uh, it's the granddaddy of uh, all optimizers. Um, this is actually a very um, a very old technique. I think it, it was invented in 1951, so way before uh, AI was uh, even uh, uh, invented. And it's still heavily used today, and, um, and it's very uh, well understood and, and, and predictable, you could say. And, um, you know, I guess that's the first optimizer you should start from uh, before you try the more advanced one. Just run a baseline using SGD and see what kind of accuracy you get. And then you can go and try the more, uh, you know, the fancier uh, and more complex optimizers. But SGD is uh, always a good place to start. Training. So we've pretty much covered the training process, right? Uh, so just a quick recap. Uh, we start from a data set. And again, I'm focusing on deep learning here. Uh, uh, start from a data set, slice it in batches, push each batch through the neural network, computing, multiply and accumulate, etc., etc., and uh, getting to the output layer, and then using the loss function to uh, measure the difference between truth, right, and, uh, and your predictions, and then running back propagation uh, from the output layer all the way to the front using an optimizer to update model parameters, okay? So that's... Uh, that's for uh, for deep learning. For traditional machine learning algorithm, um, it, the technique is going to be a little uh, a little different. But you know, it's the same. I mean, it's the same big picture. Again, start from a data set and let the algo learn iteratively from the data and update some parameters in uh, in whatever way you know it's uh, it's designed to do. And at the end, you get a model. Okay, and you do this thing again and again and again, measuring accuracy. Until uh, until you get good results. Underfitting. So uh, I talked about regularization uh, just a minute ago, and uh, and regularization is trying to fight a problem called overfitting. 
Okay, overfitting means learning the data, the training data too well. Um, underfitting is the opposite. Underfitting means you have a hard time learning, even even on the training set. So, the accuracy that you get on the training set is uh, is pretty low, and it looks like you're not learning well. So, there are a million reasons why this could happen. Maybe your data is all messed up, and uh, and it's hard to extract patterns from that. Maybe you don't have enough data. Um, maybe uh, you set your hyperparameters wrong. Um, in the case of deep learning, maybe your uh, neural network is uh, too shallow. Maybe you need more neurons, more layers, and, um, and there, are, there are plenty of problems that could be uh, could be the root cause here. So uh, these are the, the two conditions you could uh, you, you want to fight, right? Underfitting because it means you're really not learning anything, and overfitting which means you're learning too well, and that's hurting your the the, the generalization of the model to uh, to new data. Okay, and regularization solves that second problem. Okay, let's go on. Validation. So validation is how you measure whether the, the, the model is doing a good job on data that it hasn't seen, right? We just talk about training. So you can easily measure how well a model is doing on the training set, okay? But um, you also want to see uh, if it's able to predict correctly data that it hasn't seen before. So that's the purpose of the validation set. So when you start um, at the at the very start of the training process, you will split your data set in two. Okay, so one part is actually used for training, and uh, and it will be used to learn and and update parameters, etc. And a, a smaller part is set aside for validation, where at the end of each epoch or each round, if if you're not doing deep learning the validation set will be scored uh, and will be used to measure uh, the model's accuracy, okay? So that gives you a sense of, okay, yes, I'm doing well, I can see I'm doing well on the training set, but how am I doing on data that I haven't seen before, okay? And so that validation step is extremely important. And if you have very good training accuracy and very low validation accuracy, then that's not, that's not great, you need to fix it. Maybe you're overfitting, you know, maybe something else. But you really want validation accuracy to be on par or really close to training accuracy because if not, then you're not going to be able to use that model for real life data. So validation, getting the validation steps right is, is critical. Weights. Well, weights, uh, I guess we've covered them. So weights are um, the parameters inside uh, a neural network and you actually have weights, which are the, the actual parameters assigned to a uh, uh, neuron connections, and you have biases um, that are uh, all, uh, additional parameters tied to individual neurons. And uh, and again, these are used to compute uh, multiply and accumulate and, and, and other, other operations, and they're updated during the training process. And, um, and you want to, uh, you know, ideally, you know, everything is fine and you never want to look at those values, but... Uh, if something goes wrong in the training process, imagine a whole bunch of weights go to zero, then it means, you know, those connections are dead. Um, so maybe that's a normal thing because maybe those connections mean, you know, they're not useful to uh, actually solve your problem. Uh, but maybe, you know, if a lot of connections go to zero, then, you know, your model is uh, probably not predicting very well. Or, um, and, and uh, weights could also go to very large values uh, and, uh, you know, increasingly large values potentially exceeding, you know, the max values that can be stored in, uh, in the floating point value. So again, you know, that could create all kinds of problems. And these problems are called um, exploding tensors and vanishing tensors, etc. And they are really, really difficult to debug. So sometimes, yes, you have to go and inspect weights and inspect gradients and understand what's happening uh, in that, uh, in that, uh, black box <laughs> that is a, a neural network so yeah that's fun stuff expectations yeah so i couldn't come up with an x word uh, but expectations are important so especially if you're dealing with in the early stages of the of the process of the project if you're dealing with people who have little understanding or no understanding of machine learning you know there's so much um uh, bullshit excuse my french uh, laying around and flying around and if you read magazine articles you know people 
seem to think machine learning is magical and just throw data at it and, and find and blah, 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 blah. Well, that's not the case. I mean, it, it's it's a proper engineering domain. So things are not simple. Things are, uh, they never work on the first try. So you have to set expectations and explain how you're going to tackle the problem and, and what kind of uh, metric it's reasonable to expect and, uh, and what kind of improvements can be delivered in the future. But you have to tell those uh, stakeholders and, 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 and business owners that no, it's not going to work in five minutes uh, and, um, and it's going to be an iterative process, right? So expectations need to be set very early on. Why? And uh, yeah, why? Uh, why do you even do machine learning in the first place? Um, and uh, that's the first question I ask customers when I meet them. It's what's the business problem you're trying to solve? Why do you want to use machine learning? Why do you think machine learning is a good technique? Um, do you just want to try it or, or is there something else, right? Um, and this is central. I mean, so many people embark on ML projects having no clue. Um, and uh, just for the sake of it or because they think it's the way to go because it's trendy, I don't know about it. It, it's not it's 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 a recipe for disaster so make sure you understand the business problem you want to solve and and challenge uh, again business owners on that and uh, and then see if the problem can be solved with machine learning or not not all problems can be solved with machine learning so sometimes you have to use something else so the why is really critical and don't start on the project until you have understood this Zero. And well, the last word is zero, right? We would like to have zero prediction errors and that's never going to happen. Uh, so you will always, always have prediction errors. Even if you have a high performing model, even if you have 99 point whatever percent accuracy, you will, your model will still make mistakes. And uh, so getting to zero errors is just not possible. And again, that's one of those expectations you need to set. Uh, having said that, you you need to look at prediction errors. They they are really uh, interesting. They they may point you at uh, at specific samples, data samples that are not predicted well, uh, and maybe you can come up with um, solutions. Uh, maybe you need to add more of those uh, samples to your data set to help the model learn them better. Uh, maybe they are just bad, uh, data, bad bad samples. Maybe there are bad pictures in your data set and even a human looking at them would not get it right. So should you leave them in? Should you drop them? You know, you can have that discussion. But uh, yes, looking at prediction mistakes is a, is a great way to improve your model. Well, that's the end of this, uh, of this episode. And um, if you want to learn more, if you want to get started with... Uh, uh, machine learning and if you're looking for uh, learning resources i would recommend um, our own machine learning classes so you can just go to aws.training slash machine learning uh, in one word and you'll find a, a collection of uh, machine learning classes from you know beginner level uh, content to pretty advanced content so uh, keep an eye on that aws.training slash machine learning and of course, you can always uh, read my blog and follow me on Twitter and uh, you'll get more content. And again, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and my podcast so that you won't miss further episodes. If you have questions or comments, uh, happy to read them. Please get in touch and I'll see you around. Bye. -bye.